Right, I'll next up. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is obviously the group of group. So we'll have some uh, event and news round of things, and we've got uh, Martin, Martin Christet talking about, say that right now, yeah. about breaking down forms, and then we have Michael Chadwick, who's over there, talking about Drupal H and UJS. Um, so this Friday, um, there's a, a mini camp Atlanta. It sounds like a long place, long way to go for a Drupal camp, but it's virtual, so the idea is it's not actually anywhere. It's you know, it's around the world. Uh, Fifteen dollar registration. Uh, I don't know if you saw the Drupal eight thing a few a few months ago. That was quite good. It was a little virtualized camp. Uh, camp. I think they go for the same time. So. Um, seems like a good idea. Uh, Drupal Camp Bristol, um, some speakers have been announced. Uh, tickets are now on sale. So £30 for the Saturday tickets, uh, free if you go to the sprints. So head along there if you like. Uh, B-Size Manchester, still not um, put their tickets on for sale yet, but um, so this is a, a security central conference in Manchester. Uh, completely free, uh, with hopefully a sponsor bar. Apparently there has been sponsor bars in the past. So, um, they've currently got four claims open, but obviously no tickets available yet. Uh, Drupal Camp Brighton uh, was meant to be last weekend, and now it just says summer. Um, so we don't think we've actually arranged this yet. I didn't look into that, but <laughs> <laughs> they, did, they did sort of reorganize things slightly on the site. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out. We'll, we'll obviously post more uh, news and events later. Um, if we get any, any news. So DrupalCon Vienna, obviously a big one. Um, uh, tickets now on sale for 540 euros. Um, so obviously there's, there's been lots of cutting as well, so there's, there's no tote bags. Um, if you want a t-shirt, you have to be a Drupal Association member or a volunteer or someone you know, connected to the conference. Um, just an effort to sort of drive down the cost of the conference. Uh, other than that, we say it's that, that's really the things that you get on the actual. Yeah, there's no business day, no business summer day on the Monday. Monday um, things on the Monday have been cut from being officially organised by the Drupal Association. Yeah. So, like, kind of communities stepping in to kind of organise that stuff themselves rather than the Drupal Association spending any money um, doing that. I think like the business summit, I'm not sure if there's a community business summit. There's normally a community summit, and I think community will probably arrange that on an ad hoc basis, but without the extra profit, it would be a bit of a conference venue. Yeah. <clears throat> there seems to be some discussion that there's actually new improvements or something. It looks like the trend did. I can't remember how much it was like last year, but no, when no, I saw that, I was pretty. Shot it up to. I, I, <laughs> I looked at it and it was like for some four hundred and seventy four pound years. So that, that, that was describing it. Yeah. yeah. That's Brexit for you. So it's, yeah. I'm all all right. Right. More expensive. Since, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's more expensive than that. Like, you know, it's like crazy. No, I wondered if we don't have to go in as well as the Spanish riding schools, but looking at the price now, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, yeah, that. Yeah. 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 Uh, Peace Street Northwest 2017, um, last, last weekend of, of September. Um, yeah, that's wrong. The blind boats tickets haven't opened today. <laughs> That. But um, I believe if they haven't sold out, they're probably selling out quite quickly. So, um, if you haven't already bought your ticket, now's the time. Uh, Drupal Camp Dublin. Um, the court paper is still open. Tickets on sale for 20 euros, which is actually 
pretty good for it. Well, it's quite a sadness of a of a drupal count. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, I tweeted it. Last time. Yeah. When I saw I saw this and I saw the other one that the prices were that more that. Do you have to about that one? Uh, probably. I mean, <laughs> yeah, 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 try. Organized by the Drupal Island Association. So they did some of the organization around the park, so yeah, I know what they're doing. Uh, NWDOC Unconf. Um, Woo! That's fun, by the way. way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, 4th of November, right here in MadLab. Um, we need some sponsors, obviously, because we have to pay MadLab to, to do this for a day. So, they give us this, this evening thing for free, but um, we'll probably be hitting up certain employers. <laughs> so, okay. ask you about it. Right. Well, I'm telling you now. It's official. Obviously, because it's an uncon, um, we expect people to come along and talk at the, at the conference. So, uh, yeah, stop preparing your talks. That's it, that's it basically. So, we'll be obviously giving new, new more. Uh, you can ask it. I'm interested. News and announcements as we go on. What was that? Who came last year? Who were coming again? Who would come again? Who would come regardless of whether or not they attended last year? <laughs> who wouldn't come? By the, by the way, the Jumbo guys, guys it's, it's, although it's, although it's labelled Drupal Icon, it's not necessarily Drupal, so come along and give Drupal talks. Mm -hmm. Perfectly happy with that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, we had a lot of people. We haven't even had someone do a genetic algorithm. And uh, encryption. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Front End United happened. Um, I know nothing about it, and I think Eli was there, so. Yeah, I went uh, for the first time, and it really, really struck me, especially refreshing on how much a Drupal concert gets up, like in three days for 504 euros. I went to Front End United and um, it was 80 euros for two days, ignoring things like sprints and bonus content that Mozilla put on, on virtual reality and stuff like that. And so 80 euros, and on average, I would say the quality was higher. Um, for, for those who don't know, this is a, a front end based uh, Drupal conference. So it's all about theming and, and styling and things. So. A, lot of it, a lot of the content is um, Drupal independent. So some yeah. of the best talks were about things like CSS variables, not SAS, actual variables in CSS that you can directly interact with in JavaScript. Um, I really good stuff on CSS period, some really good stuff on A-frame, like virtualization in the browser, and then some also very good stuff that went directly into Drupal. So like really good stuff like integrating cat map output with uh, Drupal and using that as a prototype framework and design framework. So like, Really, really good um, content. I'm definitely going to go next year and I'll even run out of it. In the Netherlands, so that's much like, uh, closer. <laughs> uh, I, I did see a few tweets from people returning from the conference and they're all excited about, about things, which is good to see. So. Um, also, the free so, bar lasted so long that the beer out. They the beer out was so funny. Uh, I'm not sure. Sure. It was sponsored, but yeah, I'm not sure which company sponsored that. Do you remember the bar market? Just to get a bar for a little jealous. We need to take this one shit by getting the bar. Sponsor the bar for our own conference, and I'll talk for a day about it. <laughs> Especially if you drink all the beer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so some news, um, just pointing a few things out here. So this is content to uh, CMS, which is a, a, a Drupal distribution that is specifically for uh, doing headless interactions. So this is a, a headless Drupal first. Um, you got? <laughs> um, so I've got some links there if you want to have a look. Um, looks like an interesting project, so check it out. Uh, new Drupal 8 committer, Lee Rowlands. Um, that's uh, that's his Twitter ID, but he's also known as that on on Drupal. So let's check that out. Uh, Drupal 8.3.3 released. Kind of 
not that important because of minor bug releases, but um, obviously the science of today things. Is anybody still running 8.2? Well, I put my hand up. <laughs> 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 uh, if you didn't see, Drupal.org now supports emojis in, in comments and posts and things. They had to upgrade the database to get that to work. Uh, I don't know if you know this, the whole um, MB4 uh, string in uh, MySQL, but yeah. That's only if you're running Drupal 7, though. If yeah, you have to do all this kind of hackery on your database to actually get the spoiler emoji. So if any customer is doing Drupal 7, you can get the spoiler emoji, emoji, but there is hackery. If you do it, you play it, it should be. Should be fine, perfect. I think Drupal Org is mostly 7 now, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. There's some 6 right, right around there somewhere. But, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, who uses Drupal VM? Good. Uh, there's now a <laughs> Docker solution. <laughs> uh, so, you can use, instead of favorite, you can use Docker instead. So, um, that seems to be gaining traction. It's still experimental, but <clears throat> um, I thought I'd point it out there in case you're already using Drupal VM. All right. Uh, we'll pass on to Martin Christett with some uh, breaking down forms. <laughs> Good evening, thanks for coming to hear this. I'm going to be talking about a module I've just released on Drupal.org called Step by Step, uh, which is about breaking down forms, um, as Phil said, uh, and quite a lot more. And the idea is that you can use it to guide people through the power of Drupal. I'm Martin Quester, as I said, and if you need to get hold of me, I'm Martin underscore Q, and you'll either find me here or in Leipzig in Germany. So I wonder if you can remember the first time you saw this screen. Congratulations, you installed Drupal, now what? And you click that link, as we probably know now, and then you appear on the site. It's your site, there is no content here. What do you do now? What we set out to do, uh, what we found we really needed to do was to uh, get people beyond that point. Um, and this is just one solution. There are lots out there because this is a big discussion in the Drupal world. I think I heard it mentioned at DrupalCon uh, a year ago, nearly a year ago, that it is one of Drupal's biggest weaknesses compared to its competitors. It's got all this power, but if you're just starting on day one, very little guidance is given to what to do. And because Drupal is so powerful, because there's so much you could do with it, it's hard to bundle anything in there that gets people going in one direction because not everyone is going to be using Drupal for the same thing. So this isn't the only solution, but this is uh, what we found we needed uh, to reduce Drupal's UI to one step at a time. Got a couple of use cases for you. This is a town in the northeast of the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is their petrol station. You can get little bottles of uh, petrol here. That was their railway connection, but due to the civil war and other things, um, the town is pretty unconnected. One thing they do have fully working is their mobile phone mast. They are on the internet when they have electricity. And this is a group of people from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and I think a couple of neighboring countries uh, being trained by a couple of my colleagues to make the first websites in their languages on Drupal. Um, this guy's teaching them and this guy's making sure there's power 
keeping the uh, generator running. What we found is that these people, although they may have come with a computer, they might not have actually used it before, they've been sent uh, by someone else, or they may have worked out, you know, using a mouse and a keyboard and so on, but what do they want from a website? What do they need to think about? How do they go about it? Uh, there's a lot of things to be thinking about at once. And we have two weeks, typically, to get them from that point to switching their website on. And uh, what we found is we'd like to get them up and running as quickly as possible in the beginning. So they're really absolute beginners. We're giving them Drupal, but we're building our own distribution that uh, is there to make it easier as much as possible. We want to get them off to a quick start, by which we mean in the space of an hour or two, their website's up and running. So they've got a lot of things to think about to get that far. And rather than tell them, right, now click here, now find your way through the menu, now use this uh, URL to get there, we want to actually take them through one step at a time, what you might call a wizard, and ask the questions that they need to answer first in order to not upset things later. For example, you really need to decide right at the beginning of your website which languages you're going to be making it in. And uh, if, you get, if you don't think about that first, you'll have to revisit a lot of the things you do uh, later on. We do want understanding. We do want them to actually be in a position where they can maintain their website once the workshop's over. But we can worry about that a little bit later in the week or in the second week. Once we thought about that, we realized we had another use case for basically the same thing. Because the staff that we send specialize in training, they're not necessarily the most uh, high power Drupal users either. And they've got some jobs that they very occasionally have to do where they have to go through uh, some of the advanced Drupal backend, get things right in the right order. And we don't want them to have to be thinking about that or referring to notes or risking <coughs> getting it wrong and messing someone's website up. So we found if we could guide them through the steps that they need to do as well, then we could save them time and stress. Um, and one example we've got there, we're using A gear, so we've got a big multi-site set up. And a, a great use of that is that if someone's done a great site, you can clone it and give it to someone else, and they can do stuff with it and develop it further. But there are things, settings on there you definitely want to undo before you hand uh, a clone's website to someone else. So we make sure uh, that our staff on the ground think of all of those things by basically walking them through the steps. So we have an API called Step by Step. It was previously called Simple Step, which is really confusing because of simple text. So it's now called Step by Step. And you can use it to take forms that already exist in Drupal, or you can build in some of your own as well. You can present them in a sequence which you decide that it's a wizard, although it turns out that we can't use wizard because when we're asking people who've never used a computer to, before to help us translate the back end, they think wizard and they're thinking of sorcerers uh, from uh, their local customs and it's really confusing. So we're calling it a guide, but you are thinking about it as a wizard. And as someone goes through those steps, uh, we want to track what they've done what they've skipped, what was maybe decided, deemed to be not necessary uh, for them. And if they want to, uh, the user can go back and change some of the steps. And if they change something which affects the later steps, then they get reset. So they're told, oh, you'll need to, you change the theme, you're going to need to change your color settings all over again as well. It's an API, which means that we've used it, and we're hoping other people will use it as well. We've currently got three wizards that we've built on it, and I'm kind of excited to find out what, what else people could think of using it for. What that means is that when our workshop, based on our new distribution, uh, when users get to their site, rather than the blue Drupal 7 theme, or 8 one day we hope, that says there is no content on your site, we're going to give them a big start button. We're going to make it even bigger and more um, impactful soon. But there's just one thing to click on that page, unless you feel like advanced options. But we hope they won't they'll be intimidated by that and won't want to go advanced. So I'm going to just walk you through how you might uh, do this, because actually uh, making a module in Drupal is dead easy. And this is one of those that uh, anyone could do, I believe. Um, if you want to make a module, and you haven't done this before, you need to know you're going to need two files in a directory. And the first one is super simple, just four lines of text in uh, that file. That tells Drupal what your module is and 
uh, where it belongs in the big long list of modules. So once you've created that, you can save it and never look at it again. And you can uh, look at your module file instead. And to make a step-by-step -step wizard, you need to implement one hook. And here it is, it's called hook step-by-step -step sequence data. And so if your module is called initial setup, then your function will be called initial setup step-by-step -step sequence data. Unfortunately, you have to type it more than you have to say it. And it needs to return one array called whatever, but I'm calling it sequences because this array defines one or more wizards, which step-by-step -step thinks of as sequences. And uh, today we're just going to be looking at one, which is the initial setup. You need to tell it what your sequence is called. So I'm calling it initial setup. And because uh, it integrates with the menu API, you have to provide it translated and untranslated. You can add in some other text, which appeared on that start page. Um, and I told a lie before, you do actually have to implement one other hook as well, because you probably want to define a permission. And so you have to implement the Drupal core hook permission. And you need to provide the path, which is where someone's going to be able to find it. So we've set up our distribution to end up at initial underscore setup when someone's got a freshly installed site. And it will continue to route to that until uh, they're done with the wizard. And then it will undo itself. And I'll show you that in a moment. And then you have to define the steps. But I'll come on to that in a moment. But if you've done this much, then you will get your step-by-step -step sequence with the start button ready to go, but it hasn't got anything in it yet. Once you've defined the steps, clicking the start button will take you to the first step, and then you can click to continue and go through the rest. Here is a form that, without a wizard, someone has to find their way through the menu to define the name and the slogan for their site. Now, we've created a multilingual version of this, but Drupal Core has, has a single language version, and then you can go somewhere else and translate it. But not, with, not content with making a multilingual page, we actually wanted to, fit, to guide people to, to fill this in at the right time. So this is not the first step in our initial setup wizard, but it is the simplest. Uh, what we want, basically, is to get this into the sequence. And to do that, we need to know two things. We need to know the URL uh, path where this form is found. And we need to look into the uh, source code of the page to find out the form ID, uh, because step-by-step -step uses Drupal form, form alter uh, API. So you need to know form IDs uh, to hack into all of that. So with those two bits of information, and back in the same function, you can define a step by giving it a name and a machine name. So the site name is the machine name. And then you provide those two uh, pieces of information, the path and the form ID. If you save that and install the module, uh, you would then find that clicking the Start button in uh, your wizard gets you from this form. Instead, it will appear uh, with a complicated URL, but it has its own URL as well. And instead of a submit button, we've now got two buttons over on the other side instead. That's intended to indicate movement. We're still trying to uh, work out exactly what we do to indicate that this isn't just a form. Now it's a wizard. We're probably going to present it uh, in some kind of frame so it looks like it's sort of floating, not overlay, uh, but something a bit like that. And the form has been modified. And if you now click Save and Continue, the form gets submitted to Drupal as before, but instead of landing up back on the same page, it will take you to the next step. And the step-by-step -step system will keep track of the fact that you've done this step of your setup. Now, here's uh, another screen that we have for adding languages. We've modified Drupal core again. Uh, but this screen is different, because once you've added a language, well, you might want to add another one. So we don't just want people to act, uh, interact with this screen once and be whisked away whether they like it or not. So you can also set up a step in your wizard uh, that is set to wait until done in nice American English. You can click this Submit button and add as many languages as you like. And you'll still be on this page until you decide that you're ready, and then you can get continue onwards. I would have just had continue there, but I was asked to make the button consistent every time. Um, 
but that's not really saving anything additional. You save here and then you continue forwards. Some steps have got, uh, some forms have got links to other things on them. And so if we're incorporating this form into a wizard, we want to allow people still to click on some of that stuff. They can edit their language settings, but we need to make sure that when they've gone on that diversion, when they save it, the destination is set uh, so that they will continue in the form uh, sequence afterwards. So if you've got a more complicated step uh, in your sequence, there are a number of things that you can define in addition to these basic three settings. The API allows you to override some text, wait until done, as I had just uh, as I described just now. Uh, you can forbid people from skipping that step. You make sure that they submit some kind of answer uh, to that form. You can decide that a particular form shouldn't be shown to someone if some other condition is true. So you can define a function uh, that will work that out. For example, a theme which only has certain uh, abilities in it might mean that you don't need uh, to make certain other decisions. We've got some themes that you can define a background image for. It's a bit old school. It turns out to be very popular with our users. But some of our themes don't accept a background image, so we won't bother taking them to the step where they upload a background image. So you can define that kind of thing. And if a, a given form would allow you to change a setting which affects some of the other things you might have done, then you can reset other steps. So you can end up with quite a complicated thing, but if uh, you're just starting, it's as simple as uh, filling in those three things. Once you've uh, worked your way through uh, one of these uh, wizards, uh, this one is ours for setting up, you get an overview. This was the advanced options. That's all it was. It takes you to, it shows you a list where you can directly access any of the steps, and it shows you what you did with them, whether you completed it, you skipped it, it wasn't applicable at the time that you came to that step. And so you can revisit any of those. You can click that button over there and it will all get set and not done. That's one of the things that our other wizard does when we're cloning a website so that a new person is told they have to do all of these steps again. Oops. Uh, we've added uh, one thing to our setup wizard. Um, so there's another function in there as well. But if someone uncheck this button and then uh, this box and then clicks that button, remember I said previously the distribution comes with this uh, wizard as the first thing that you land up in when you log in, or once you uncheck that box, it doesn't. And uh, somewhere along one of our other forms, you then get to define uh, what the front page should be when you're ready to launch your site. So step by step, uh, the code appeared on Drupal.org about a week ago, or two weeks ago. Uh, it comes with a nice big orange warning that it is not covered by the security advisory uh, system at the moment. So the next thing to do is get the code reviewed and opt into that and get approved for that. Um, and then there will be a 1.0 release for Drupal 7. And as soon as possible, we'll then work on porting it to Drupal 8. Um, but we're, we're quite happy to be uh, catching up with the curve as much as being on Drupal 7 right now, because um, we've been understaffed for a long time. Uh, but we will be uh, implementing some feature requests if they come in, now that we're on Drupal.org. And one of the things I thought of even as I was preparing this version of the talk was to work out um, which parts of the form you might want to include in a step. Uh, it would be nice if step-by-step -step could help you do that by uh, showing you what makes up a form so that you can uh, trim it down and, and only get the bits that you want. And one day, uh, maybe that whole thing could become a graphical uh, wizard building interface so you can uh, drag and drop or click and uh, select parts of forms, put them into a sequence, reorder the sequence and all of that. With as much code as there is, making a GUI for it will actually be quite straightforward and a lot of fun. So if I ever have the time, I'll definitely be doing that. And then, as I say, uh, as soon as possible, we'll be porting the whole thing to Drupal 8. So it's out there. As I say, we've thought of three things to use it for. I'm sure there are more. So it'll be really interesting if, uh, to find out if anyone does uh, create some wizards for any part of the Drupal UI that you are using uh, and providing for your users. Um, and I'm happy to take questions now or on Twitter, I'll put my hand up again when I make this disappear.
Are there any questions now? Have you tried to implement it on anything like stupidly complex, like analyzer? No, but I don't see why it wouldn't work if it's using Drupal forms. If it's using something else, uh, it would be quite hard to make it work, I think. One of the things that was stupidly complex is actually Drupal's core user um, management forms. If you're deleting groups of users, it takes you through what seems like a multi-step form, but it's unlike any other multi-step form that I've come across because they're actually not the same form. So the form ID changes, but the URL doesn't change. And we needed bits of that to uh, do redirect and bits of it not to do redirects. So the API ended up a lot more complex just to make that even work. Um, I bet there's stuff out there uh, that's, that doesn't work yet, but quite a lot does, because yeah, I, I know because I've got the battle wounds in the things I did get working. What about things like uh, forms embedded in SQL, modal, and that kind of complicated form? If it's already embedded in a modal, uh, I imagine it's complicated. Because um, this is a modal that doesn't look like a modal in some ways. It's you know, a modal is a, a kind of wizard. So probably you'd need to cut, try and extricate it somehow. But really, all you need is the form ID. Yeah? You need a path as well. So it does need to have its own URL because uh, SimpleSet really is hacking an existing. Um, an existing destination in the Drupal system, and just presenting it very differently, and then taking you to another one. So if you want to, sorry. Um, not, not <coughs> when you give the tool an idea in part, does it just fill in all the fields, or do you have to specify the field names as well? If you don't specify anything, it pulls in the whole form. Yeah. But if you just want certain fields, then you can specify those. You can either do it by exclusion or inclusion. Um, so you went for people having to. Specify a form rather than a field. Yes, by the form. Yeah, it has to know the form in any case because yeah, yeah, so. form also won't yeah. work unless you know what the form yeah. ideas. Um, yeah, so in the, in the simplest case, it just gives you the whole form. Did you run into anything interesting performance-wise with people being on uh, mobile connections or who's not familiar or that sort of thing? I guess it's just a simple form. It's just a form yeah. with a couple of extra buttons, so there shouldn't be any no. any impacts. It's a lot less high tech than it looks. That's good. Uh, so I guess adding your own steps, all you need is a form in the normal way that you have. Yeah, you can make your own forms. And path into that. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Um, and how much do you need for free for the system? You had that last step with all the completed and skipped bits. Is that for free? Do you get that? Uh, yeah, progress? all of that comes. Yeah, the, the list of um, your progress. Yeah, that's all calculated for you. The only thing that we added, and I'll share that. I think it's shared in the in documentation anyway. Yeah. This this extra little bit is added on. That's not part of the standard thing. You could have that in your um, module that uses step by step. It's not exactly in field. You don't need that code issues. The original form had validation. You've got a good white field that you then don't include. Yes. Is that? Uh, and I, but I think Drupal's actually clever enough because you can hide fields <laughs> in a number of ways. But if you hide a field by setting access equals false, then validation doesn't, I think, doesn't cause you a problem there. Unless, unless the form contains data which, because of an update somewhere else, is now no longer permitted, that might cause you a problem. And I did, I've, I think I've left a hanging to-do in the code somewhere that says uh, look out for that kind of thing and, and fix it. But I haven't come across a case where that's been a problem yet. And the SPY can just set the form with just the field you want anyway. Yeah, yeah. All right. I said I'd remind you of my. Twitter handle there it is. What's an underscore Q or I'll we'll be in the pub.
JavaScript framework, and uh, the purpose of it really is to sort of pull in as and when you need it. So therefore, you don't have to commit to a full monolithic framework. You can pull it in when you need it, or you can use it as a monolithic framework. Um, so a little bit about me. That's me. I'm my colleague. Local. I'm a developer at Access. Who again? Local. Uh, Working with Drupal for three years, primarily front end, but I do a bit of site building, a bit of back end, which makes these guys cringe a little bit. Uh, and yeah, I realize that's a thing, you've got to put the Twitter handle, so that's me, just want to find it, it's my Cheers, <laughs> uh, So, what am I even in for? Yeah, like I said, I'm going to be talking primarily about uh, Vue.js and how it's kind of like a newish kid on the block. Uh, front ends, what people start to talk about it, a lot of buzz around it. Uh, so therefore, I sort of decided to give it a go in my own time, see what it can do, and then I eventually started working in some of our projects of access and started pulling it in, like I said, when I needed it, rather than being a sort of full committed framework. Um, I'll run through some general concepts of UJS and kind of get you guys understanding <coughs> if you don't know anything about it, what it kind of does. Um, and then towards the end, I'll sort of show you how that works with Drupal and what you can do with Drupal and Vue. Uh, so yeah, like I said, Vue.js, um, so if you were going to build sort of, moving away from Drupal, if you were going to build sort of a, a large scale web app, I guess you call it, you would look to your sort of embers, your angulars, those kind of frameworks, uh, which provide you with models, routes, uh, controls, components, which are a big thing. Um, but there's a lot of bloat to that, so you've got to commit to that um, if you were building something. Uh, this is kind of where view, I feel, fits in to a, a nice degree. Um, it kind of takes those concepts, but instead of running with them and making its own thing, it kind of stands on the shoulders of the, the giants of the last set. Um, so yeah, you're looking at it in more a UI enhancement tool, um, pulling it in when and where you need it, uh, or you can power up a full application with it as well, which is quite nice. So if you start to get into uh, quite a bit, and you look at the ecosystem that's building quite quickly around it, uh, there's a lot of nice stuff coming in to play to help you build those kind of Angular-style applications. 
so yeah, why should you care? <laughs> Design from the ground up, um, be lightweight. Uh, again, that kind of resonated with me because there's a lot of pulls around frameworks at the moment. Um, getting involved in them is a big commitment. You've got to know that the project you're working with is going to require it. So when obviously you get access to a lot of Drupal builds, um, if it's not needed, then you're not going to commit to it. Angular or and the framework. So when you can pull in Vue.js and start just enhancing those front end elements like forms, uh, tables, uh, those kind of things, it's quite nice to know that you can do that. Uh, obviously, that therefore competes with jQuery, uh, which is built into Drupal Core. Um, but Vue is way nicer. <laughs> um, and I was, one of the reasons why is uh, one thing I'll go into in a second. So yeah, extremely easy to pick up. Uh, the learning curve is very low. Um, if you are really familiar with JavaScript, you'll have it down in an evening. Um, and that's another thing as well, is that a lot of it is quite raw JavaScript. It's using the SS standards now as well. So you don't have to be learning something very new when you're doing that. Um, you're actually learning core fundamentals rather than going off on your own little uh, island. Um, and also, one thing as well is documentation is really well documented. Um, again, the community is growing by the day. More and more uh, resources out there. There's also, a, I think, the are doing actual view comms as well, which is quite, a, I imagine, a big step for them. Um, so that's quite a good thing. Uh, and again, it's built this idea is built to be a progressive framework, so I've read that and obviously what's going on at the moment, I thought it was going to be a social uh, labour progressive framework or something like that, but it means that it's plug and play, so it's it's not going to dictate what you're doing um, and helps when you come to your libraries and projects that are already there, you can know how to speak to Oh, I know, Dad, turn that off. The live stream have got my face. You said it's a conference. Is there a company behind it, or is it? Um, so it's kind of like a, a Dries situation where one guy built it, and I, I, I think he created a company out of that. He, he originally worked at Google and built it there. Um, I, I haven't looked at the background of it to be fair. Um, that's the wrong thing. That's the wrong thing. Where'd you turn the screen say though? Yeah, I'm gonna have to just not talk as much on a slide. Um, hang on. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, yeah. So again, the progressive element of it means plug and play, you're just in library and projects, it can plug into that rather than it being coming and stomping at all and dictating what you're supposed to be doing and uh, putting it in here. Um, but again, I'll come back to this point that if you do want it to power something, so I mean, in a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about um, Drupal and obviously making that a, a headless application, it can power a front end if you need it to. So, what can it do? So, I'll run through a few of the concepts of UJS. Um, the primary one being data binding, uh, data binding to a data binding. So obviously this is where your UI and your model um, become synced uh, in real time. Um, basically rather than being a sort of jQuery element where you've got to run into your DOM, take stuff out, manipulate it back, etc. This is keeping them in sync at all times. Um, giving you that reactivity uh, on your front end and you'll sort of, you'll see in a little bit what that can kind of do. Um, so the framework itself to achieve that was built, uh, it was inspired by the MVVM uh, model or pattern, uh, kind of like a MVC, but this one's view, uh, model view, view model. That's what uh, you want to say. So yeah, idea being you've got your models, your data, how that's been supplied to you, Put the view on this side and three main put the view model. So 
directives. You'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on those in a minute. That'll be telling your model, sync this to my DOM, and then you've got DOM listeners that are sending it back to the model to reactively update that in real time. However, you're managing that in the expressions you, you apply to your directives. Um, so that's quite a nice way to sort of visualize how this is actually doing the magic. So running to an example, um, we'll start super basic. You've got your script at the top, which is embedding view by CDN. This can be done three ways. You can put in NPM, but you can also use the view CLI tool, which is really useful if you are building those bigger applications and kind of uh, bootstrap kind of uh, project for you, which is quite useful. Um, but yeah, starting off, we've got the div. We're going to ID that with an ID of app. Uh, that's basically what we're going to tell the view when we instantiate the view. We're going to create that and tell it that the element of the value of app. So we've now created a, a stage, I guess you call it. So everything inside that div will now work within the realms of view, uh, and view will know what it means. So all we're doing here is just looking at a variable message. Um, so I'll run into this actually first. We've got the data object. So the data object will, is where we can set it in. Here we're just creating a message variable with a string, and then at the top we can just render that out. That's just one way binding. So now our model, which is data, is attached to our front end, and that will just print out the string. Um, so that's quite too basic. I mean, I won't show an actual what that renders because it will just render that. Um, but you can kind of see where the simplicity of this is starting to come in. Um, even if you just start to do that with uh, jQuery, you can kind of see how you've got to drill into the DOM, check that the elements there, pull out the, the data from that, if it's the, the string itself, and put it back in, or set the variables kind of thing. Um, and it, it's done then, it's, it's kind of on load, it's, it, it's not bound in any way. Um, so that's quite helpful. Um, And then moving on from that, we've got two-way binding. So two-way binding just means that you can post it back, uh, and that brings uh, the NVDM system into play um, and makes your system or uh, component or app more reactive. Uh, so again, the only addition here, uh, got an input. So we're doing all the exact same thing with view uh, objects. Got stage set still, um, but what we've done here is uh, use the uh, view directive. Uh, again, I'll go into a little bit more detail on those in a slide, but the directive basically will tell you you uh, use this expression, which in this regard is a variable, um, and that is bounded to this model. So this input is now bound to this model, and we're also still rendering it separately. Um, at the top, so they're, they're two different uh, binds in there. And they're in sync, which is the best way about it. So this is the example in action. So we've got the input. Uh, that is, yeah, so we're updating the text in there. And um, one thing I'll run through, so what I'm looking at there in console is uh, view Chrome uh, DevTools uh, extension extremely useful if you're going to work with view. Um, you can obviously modify all these variables and look everything in the console, but this just wraps it in a view context and makes it a lot nicer to work with. Uh, but yeah, so we're seeing our model actively update, and then that's coming back up to the top and updating our interface all in real time. Uh, so that's the two-way binding happening and in action there. Dead quick. So yeah, like I said, okay. going on about directives. Um, so yeah, they, they're what, there's what, they are what you use to tie your DOM uh, to model using expressions. Um, the rule of thumb is that there'll always be a single expression to every directive, except for loops. They'll have to, obviously, uh, they work a little bit differently. Um, and it's always using this V hyphen. Syntax. So if you're looking at your markup, you'll always have the hyphen 
directive name. And there's some examples of directives. Top two, the basic text and HTML directive. They're just printing out that variable that we have before. First one, obviously, just doing a plain text. HTML one will render any HTML in there. You've got conditionals as directives as well, which is quite nice. So if you want to hide elements based on some logic and model and your methods, you can do that. So a condition would be tied to a method in your JavaScript, and then obviously whatever logic you're in there. Um, if it returns true, that will show. You can also throw in helps as well. Um, you will pick those up and work with those and know what to do. Uh, and then be bind. So obviously, you can't with actual HTML attributes, you can't just curly brackets stick the variable in there. It needs to be bound to view. So that's what the bind will do. And then you see, so I've got HRS, alt, and title. Luckily, you don't have to type be bind every time. You can shorthand it. There's, there's also some. Uh, Event handlers that do the same thing and they shorthand quite a lot of stuff because I mean it's a difficult thing because you are kind of cluttering up markup and it becomes very um, in that regard you've got three items there but you don't want to mess it up too much and keep it clean basically so it's quite nice to have a shorthand capability um, and yeah like I said the D4 which I'll go uh, that's kind of the, the exception in this uh, this rule. Uh, so yeah, then handle. Obviously, a lot of JavaScript you'll have want to run when something happens, especially if you're on like forms, uh, you want to have to trigger uh, using the vom directive. So obviously, when a lot of the uh, logic itself uh, is usually quite complex, uh, you can actually put logic inside the the directive itself, but you'd rather just tie it to expression like you've done previously. And therefore, that just runs that method once you've called it. Uh, and yeah, so you've also got uh, extended with event modifiers. So event modifiers are kind of like how in jQuery you've got prevent default and that kind of stuff. So if you want to jump into the code and make sure that they don't do something you don't want it to do. You can always have those with uh, modifiers. Um, and here's an example. So again, we're always just modifying a button here. Be on click. So again, you can shorthand that. Um, just a uh, colon click. Uh, and that is tied to an expression called greet. And in view, this uh, is looking a little bit different down here now. So obviously, we've got the data model here, but we then Break onto a new line, build our methods uh, object here. So we could start building these functions in a bit below. This one's pulled from the main view website. So all this does runs through a free, and when you click that button, you'll run it and it'll alert. Um, so that's the kind of obviously a very basic example of a of an of a method. Um, but that is that sort of interaction between them is still uh, valid by the sort of forward binding. And um, so, yeah, that'll trigger an alert. And then I think one thing that resonated with me quite heavily was the form handling. So, they put a lot of work into um, the V model concept. So, pretty much every form attribute can be modified in some way. Um, and it's where it kind of comes into its own. So, a lot of time with forms, if you're working with a lot of static. Uh, HTML, and you're having to add in animations, you're relying on possible back end um, validation, but you might want a bit more front end validation. There's JavaScript libraries out there that can be a bit bloated. Uh, View can come into its own with this and help you with that sort of um, visual feedback to the user. So, implementing validation, real time validation, um, one I played with the other day, but I'm not sure about the usability of it. But, uh, Type in email addresses. So obviously that idea that as you're typing it is letting you know you're not quite there yet. Start giving me a real format for an email and then I'll pass you on, that kind of stuff. Um, but there's a, a lot of situations where I found myself you're actually going through forms in websites and you're uh, the user might be building something towards the end, so you can be pulling out the data from the form in real time and sticking it in an element on the sidebar or somewhere below it. We've used one example in a client recently where we're having them 
manually adding people, they're, they're submitting people to their website, to their local group, um, and they can do this in multiple uh, times. So if we let them fill in the form, and it adds them to a little table below, so they can see that people are adding, shows them how many people are adding, it validates them as well, um, and then they can get rid of that. And what that does is just builds a little bit of markup. We then post that once they submit it. It's just that sort of feedback that, that really sort of comes into its own, where view again is super fast uh, and also the code itself is really lean. Um, so yeah, forms are a massive thing. Um, there's, a, there's almost too much to put on slides, so I didn't actually give any examples of that. But I recommend going on there, uh, documentation, and just having a look at all the different things you can do with forms at a very basic level. And you can imagine starting to what you can do. Um, so yeah, so where does Drupal fit into this? Um, I mean, it entirely depends on what you want. Uh, again, it comes back to that idea that you use something you can pull in when you need it, rather than it being something that will dictate a project. Um, uh, so, however, I mean, yeah, so yeah, coming back to the idea that you're using Drupal, at the moment I've really had experience with it just as a sort of enhancement tool rather than being something that powers the front end. Um, so, we'll go into what I've sort of managed really with it. And the main thing is Drupal Forms. Um, Again, it can, be, it can be quite difficult because obviously, if you're using the form API, you've obviously got to wrangle it a little bit <coughs> if you want to give the markup that you want. Um, but this is the kind of reason why I want to do this talk and how I want to instead of do because I want to start these conversations where how do we look at these modern tools and the, the way they're doing things and there's better ways of uh, um, integrating with Drupal. So obviously, I've started using it, still kind of works with beautiful forms and helps me do that validation that I was talking about that's instant, a little bit more reactive. You can also implement um, the stuff I was talking about before where you can have visual feedback, a little bit more in-depth visual feedback. Um, and animations as well. There's a lot of animations built into view. Um, you've got a little uh, animation API, so it actually means you don't have to integrate other libraries to help you that. Obviously, you use CSS on top of that, but it's nice to have it built in. Uh, yeah, so passing data around from Drupal, obviously, we using sort of like routes and controllers in Drupal is very helpful. Obviously, if you've got a back end developer who knows what that actually is, um, you can actually sort of <laughs> 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 and can build them in better ways than I can. Uh, it, it's sort of it's nice to know that once you have that, you can build a front end that's a little bit more flexible, um, rather than just being passed up. Uh, and also the ability to pass it back is very simple. So obviously, um, there's a tool I use called Axios, that's not right. uh, which is a promise-based PHP um, uh, service. So I use that with you in conjunction with you. That's recommended by. Uh, view themselves, even though they do have their own um, name view, uh, it's pretty strong to promise the service. But that, being able to pass that back to Drupal and then obviously Drupal doing what it needs to do with it, it kind of frees me up in the front end to kind of build those in spaces a little bit cleaner, a little bit more maybe a modular way. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of where the, the sort of routes and controls come to it. And as I mentioned, behaviors there. Passing data into view, obviously you're using is pretty much just then JavaScript. So combining that with Drupal behaviors, um, basically just me at the moment just then wrapping it uh, a whole lot into Drupal behaviors, um, and in that regard, I'll be able to then pass the interview, use context, and say this is Drupal provided me this. Uh, so that's kind of works well. I, I can imagine I'm doing it in a certain way. Again, why I'm not put code examples up because um, some of it's still uh, ongoing, let's say. And I guess the big one being is uh, it's Drupal. Obviously, I'm sure we've all heard now that you can do this in core. 
um, even the distribution mentioned before. Uh, when I saw that the other day, I was quite excited the idea that there would be a sort of almost consistent set of tools that I can pull from and set a uh, sort of API up first, and I can start really playing with uh, how we can use Vue.js and um, and not have to worry too much about the and controls, which I do a lot. Um, so yeah, utilizing that core REST, uh, those core REST resources, you can obviously provide you with JSON, all this JSON and they will be able to handle that. So we've got uh, an ecosystem that's currently, again, growing as we speak. Um, stuff like roots, uh, state management, which is something I've started learning, which is uh, in the JavaScript framework world, very, very useful. Um, kind of helps you um, build your code more modular in components, but helps state move between them. Um, and yeah, like I said before, view resource was the sort of first kid on the block for view in terms of um, sort of asynchronous calls, uh, HTTP promise uh, based services, but Axios it seems to be more recommended one now. Uh, it's a standalone library, so it's not got anything to do with view. Um, they just do it better. Um, but yeah, I've seen a lot of examples in the sort of view a world where people are building these full-scale applications um, and then obviously just choosing how they want to provide that data. Um, so it, it does show that the ability of view has to view has the ability to be powered a full application if needed. Um, which is quite I think uh, to me has more to it than if I had to go commit to Angular or if I had to commit to Ember, because you're able to sort of make that decision per project and you'd be able to know the tool as well. Um, so I think that's quite a strong super view. Um, so just to wrap up, yeah, super light, super light, super affordable, uh, dead fun to like, actually work with. Um, there's no you don't get over there with like all this stuff, like if you were to learn some frameworks and um, those examples, once you start even playing, once you start going beyond those, you start getting a little bit more um, excited. So it's going through the documentation is really uh, quite a fun experience. Um, again, it's based on that MVV uh, pattern, which gives you that reactive to the binding between the two. Uh, Dom, your, your model, which is again, yeah, I got a bit to talk about. Um, and then, yeah, coming back to Drupal, uh, at the moment it's, it's still quite early days for me and how it's working with Drupal. Um, but the idea of this more API first driven Drupal could possibly bring you into a little bit more of a, a stronger light. Um, there's also a lot of resources out there that I'm starting to see where. Even something like a Drupal admin theme couldn't be powered by something like this. Um, basically, there's nothing in the Drupal admin theme at the moment that hasn't been built with you. Um, so it's that kind of uh, those kind of discussions that I can imagine find your uh, interest to have. Um, but yeah, check it out. It's dead fun. Cheers. <laughs> Of, of Jumbo 4, we're looking at the possibility of moving those bits 
to view as well because I think you have exactly what you said, mm -hmm. flyweights only touches the parts that you need it to touch, the MBBM, yeah. uh, the interaction. Um, so it, it, you know, that's, you know, it, it, it's way above my, <laughs> my, my skill set. All I can do is look at the progress that's made. And the media manager had done nothing for like two years of people seriously working on it. And then switching to, you know, someone said, well, let's try to view one week. Yeah. Is, is there a, a, a sort of community, food community, with, uh, you, or... um, I've not seen any groups or discussion forums on it. I've seen modules that try and pull it in and don't do master maps. Um, yeah, I'm not still quite view, view, I think. Yeah, it's really um, I mean, view itself, it, it, view itself is quite mature, mm. but in terms of it integrating into other uh, yeah, I think, I think it's still quite new. I think there's a lot of talk more about the larger scale frameworks as well. So, like the Ember, I think Ember framework, that's I think a bit more on the radar of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so, there's a big discussion in the Dublin, I think, around the Ember and um, yeah. React. But with, the, with those, it's very much a case of exactly what you were saying it's all in or nothing. Yeah. And view is very much, we can just do that one. One bit, whatever that one bit yes. might be in your use case. Um, yeah, I mean, as that's much of it, if you want without it interacting, by understanding anyway, yeah. is without interacting with it, with it or affecting everything else. Yeah, and it's like, like I said, it's kind of, um, I feel like these kind of tools are uh, becoming very mature now. They, they're, they're good to look at and say, are we using the right tools or are they in So, for example, is jQuery something that we should be using to power our, all our interactive elements in the back end of Drupal? Um, also, thanks for immediately validating my thought by saying that. <laughs> 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 That's what it um, Yeah, so I think the beauty of view is that it is that puzzle element and things like Ember. I think Ember obviously has a massive open source community, so this is alignment there. Um, but view again doesn't seem to be going anywhere different to that. Um, so the the guy who does obviously maintain it, the guy who created it, does a lot of work on it. He's very open. He does sort of very regular updates. Um, so it's always good to sort of follow him, find out where it's at, where it's going, and quite put in the direction. And um, he made a big switch. So obviously all the stuff I had on before about uh, roots and, and uh, that kind of thing. They, uh, initially, they were very close to think of bringing it actually inside the core code base. Uh, he again just said, I don't think this is where the use at. It's something that we're starting to go down the route of the uh, framework. I don't want it to go there. I just want to, I want to have an ecosystem and make people plug in where they want it. So that's where that kind of sold me on it. Quite a lot. Maybe look at the like view core. Yeah, so the core, the core concept is pretty much what the date binding stuff. And um, the component, there's, the thing is, I could have been all day talking about the stuff that it does. There's a lot of components built in. Mm -hmm. There's a key thing for JavaScript. Well, the room for another 50 minutes if you want. Pressure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I honestly I'd recommend, honestly, go on the homepage, just go in the guide and just pick. The item on the left that sort of went there and just have a look. They're really, really approachable documentation yeah. sort of gets you going with it. Um, it's, yeah. Good one. Any questions? Did you, um, so when I was looking at content, I was reading to see what it does for. Do you actually think this by its absence in uh, front of frameworks so that the content that you, you know, there that's uh, the future that they uh, support? Do you know any reason why that is? So say that again. So call center, which is yeah. the, the, the head of Drupal example distribution, um, is planning to support a bunch of different frameworks like Angular, React, Ember, and Ionic. Ionic? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but not currently listing view as something they can't support. I'm just wondering if you had any idea of why that might be. I imagine because of, again, it might come back to the fact that it doesn't dictate how data should be given to it. Um, maybe I, 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 I'm not 100% sure. They sound like all the sort of big players and frameworks, and then React is, I guess, one that could be closely aligned to it is React, because again, that's more your front end um, 
your UI components rather than being a full blown framework. Again, I've not looked into React too heavily. Um, so I can't say the, all, the, all the major differences, but um, yeah, it might be down to the fact that you don't have to do too much. Um, you can just give you what you need and you can do what, um, what you want with it once you get that. So where they support is required. But again, it might be sort of that it's not on their radar because it's clear. You said the key word there. View is not a framework. Yeah. You said you said all the other frameworks and view itself doesn't consider itself as a framework. Yeah, that's and kind of like they, they say progressive framework. Yeah. So I think we tried to avoid the, the word framework for a while, but Hey, getting yeah, yeah, yeah. other people rather than um, reducing themselves. Yeah. It might be right. But I've, I've, like I said, I clocked onto it last week, so I'm going to keep a close eye on that. It's interesting mm -hmm. to see where that goes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Right, uh, just some quick announcements then. So next month we have Jim Hill on testing and mental health. Um, that's July 11th. Uh, we do have a slot for other talks if you want to come along and give a talk <coughs> perhaps, perhaps on Joomla and yeah, the video. Well, I, 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 I've probably before and I can do it, so I'll do it if you want. Yeah, by all means, uh, get in touch. We're, we're happy to receive any, any talks you want to give. Um, What's happening in August? Oh, in August, which I always forget to about, <laughs> we have lightning talks. Um, so, uh, if you don't know what lightning talk is, it's between uh, five and say, 10, 15 minutes long, uh, no longer than 15 minutes. Uh, it should be quite short anyway. 15 minutes? Well, you've been a 15 minute talk in the past. You're in the I think so what, what we'll do is, is we'll have two full hours, we'll get as many talks in as we can. Um, so uh, we'll be looking for people to sort of suggest their talks um, from around about now, really. So if you've got an idea, then get on board. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and then we'll, uh, yeah, we'll do the talks. So you're right. It's a little sympathy there. <laughs> Uh, but for now, unless anybody's got anything else they want to talk about, we go to conference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to drink some beer. So, get you sure. Thanks a lot, Joe. Yeah, I'm going to try. 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 I'm going to try.